if you've ever been in the front leading rest until you died, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, like and comment. Uh, comment with uh, a smoke session you received in the military. Would love to hear about it or the equivalent that you've had in the civilian world being on a sports team or something like that. If you're not familiar with the channel, um, I have an insane comment section that has its own kind of weird community. Get down there, check them out. They're pretty amazing. I'm a big fan of them. Find out why everybody comes to my videos, not to watch them, but to interact in the comments section. If you're trying to support the channel, gentlemen, the biggest support of the channel right now is Big Daddy Unlimited. Big Daddy Unlimited is like the Costco of the gun world. Get in there, get cheap products. We have to buy, you know, buy into it, but they're gonna be cheaper overall if you're buying a couple products a year. So is it worth it? Depends on you. If you're looking for sweet plaid and bags, Vertex, and of course, LAX ammunition, 25% off with Grand Thumb on Vertex. I think it's like 5% off with LAX ammo. Get it in, you know, <laughs> get it in. Check it out. Appreciate you guys. Um, ladies, gentlemen, attack helicopters. And of course, my often forgotten, but not to me, AC-130 gunships. And of course, last and probably least, at 15 strike <laughs> so I'm just kidding I love you guys welcome to the channel thank you for watching today we're gonna to be going into our kind of bread and butter um, reviews that I love doing which are optics um, optics are a integral part of any weapon that you're gonna be uh, messing with so today we're gonna to be talking about the Collis uh, K16i now if you're not familiar with what that is it is a low power power variable optic it goes from one power all the way up to six power. If you're not familiar with what a low power variable optic is and you're looking at this and you're like, that's a scope, why would I want that? Who would use that? I understand where you're coming from. They look a little odd. So what a low power variable optic is, is you have a glass that uh, at its lowest magnification level aims to be red dot like. And the fact that you can shoot it quickly and it um, has good eye relief, that means you can see through it. And at the same time, when you put it up to, uh, you know, pass one power up to six power, or some optics come with eight power, like the Night Force right here, uh, that allows you to then uh, reach out with the 5.56. Now, it's not quite as good as a red dot. It's getting pretty close on the one axes, or the one powers. But um, as optic technology and glass has gotten better, these have become increasingly more popular, uh, simply due to the fact that they just really... Um, allow the AR-15, the 5.56, to really kind of stretch its legs. And many other optics use, uh, and many other guns use uh, low power variable optics, but um, the, the Collis K16i has been around for a while, and it's something that I've been meaning to review, and everyone's been asking me, but they're kind of hard to get your hands on. As far as my relationship with Collis goes, uh, no relationship with that particular company. Um, this was sent to me by Ally Outdoors. Um, they've sent me a couple other firearms in the past. I'll be doing more reviews. So uh, thank them for allowing us to send us this. Um, there's no exchange of money or ammunition. All that was provided by LAX Ammunition for this particular review. So with, uh, without kind of further ado, let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about the Collis K16i and how it stacks up to other low power variable optics like the Vortex Razor. Uh, HD Gen 2 and the uh, Leupold Mark 6, which up until now has been, well, it's still one of my favorite low power variable optics, but the Collis is, in, is a phenomenal optic. I've been uh, incredibly impressed with it. So let's talk about it. Um, first off, Collis is one of the world's oldest um, uh, optic manufacturers. They're based out in Vienna. Um, this is a second focal plane optic. What that means is, is when I zoom in with this bad boy, I have a constant reticle size. So it's not like I zoom in on it like you do with some other reticles. Um, I kind of go back and forth on which I prefer. Generally, I kind of do like um, zooming on the reticle itself. Uh, at the same time, I do see the merit in what a lot of people say that a second focal plane is more beneficial for such a small magnification range or you know, up to six or you know, eight power where the first focal plane really isn't needed. So I do understand that. I, I'm not gonna kind of take a stance on whether one is better than the other because I find that I shoot equally well with both. Um, other than to say that I think it's more optic dependent. I don't think the second or first focal plane is kind of a deal breaker for an optic. Uh, I think a variety of other factors come into play that make an optic good or bad. 
So to start off with, let's get into weight. Um, weight is something that I kind of always like to get into when it comes to optics because these optics can weigh a lot. Macaulay's is one of the lighter optics that I've used. It is in fact lighter than the Leupold Mark VI, which came in at 17 ounces. This particular optic comes in at 16.9 ounces. Uh, pretty freaking lightweight, especially compared to like the Vortex, which is weighing somewhere north of 20 ounces and something like the Night Force, which is a little bit plus over that. So when you mount the Kale's to your rifle, it is incredibly lightweight and it's very balanced depending on where you place it on your rifle. So I can definitely appreciate having a lighter optic. Of course, you do pay for that quality. Uh, it is not a cheap optic. The K16i typically comes in at around 1900 or so. Sometimes a little bit less if you can get like a demo model. I've seen these being sold for like 1500 at times. Um, it's definitely a pricey optic, and that's kind of a hard pill to swallow, especially when, especially when you could, you compare it to something like the Vortex Razor HG Gen 2, which is such a great optic at such a great price. Now, is the Kale's better? Yeah, it is uh, undoubtedly better, but it's diminishing returns once you spend the, once you start kind of spending over that. So, it's kind of more of a question of do you want the absolute best? Yeah, you can spend that extra grand over like the Vortex. Um, it's not going to be like, you know, double better than the Vortex though, you know, spending an extra thousand. It's definitely, it's undoubtedly going to be better, but you have to understand that uh, you do have kind of have that diminishing return range when it comes to optics uh, at this level because the Vortex is very good. That being said, do I recommend it? Of course. Let's get more into it. Okay, length, as far as length goes, it's a little bit longer than some of the other optics we've talked about. It's 10.5 inches compared to 10.3 on the Leupold and 10.1 on the Vortex. So a little bit longer, but there's a couple things that come into play that I think make it worth it. Eye relief. Um, eye relief is a huge factor in eye box when it comes to low power variable optics. Um, eye relief is the ability to how close I can be to the optic and still see through and get a sight picture. So as far as where I'm getting a complete sight picture, I have a complete sight picture all the way from here, all the way back to about right there. So I have a pretty generous um, range of kind of where I can get my cheek weld and still get a good sight picture. Also being off axis off of it, it's very generous. Um, it's on par with the Leupold Mark VI, but it has a couple other things that make it even better. The Vortex, in comparison, is has a really generous eye box as well. It's something that I've talked about a lot, but not quite as good as the Kale's. I consider the Kale's um, one of the most forgiving eye boxes that I've used to date. So, pretty phenomenal optic. Field of view is probably the area where the Kale's really shines. The field of view on the K16i is out of control. It's larger than the Vortex uh, Razor HD Gen 2, which I've constantly noted has a massive field of view uh, and makes for very easy to bring on a target and all that type of stuff. The K16i has a larger. So at one power, you have 134 feet of visibility. Uh, compare that to the Mark VI from Leupold, you have 105 feet at one power and compare that to the Vortex uh, HD Gen 2, which is 115 feet. You're seeing quite the increase uh, over the other optics. Now, the Mark VI at 6 power has 19.3 feet, uh, the Vortex has 20.5 at 6 power, and then the Kale's has uh, 21.6 at 6 power. So in all fields, it definitely is an improvement over the Vortex and the Mark VI. Uh, and again, like I said before, Diminishing returns, is it huge? No, it's not, except at the one power that's, that's fairly significant, but it's definitely better. It definitely makes for an easier shooting process. Now, along with just field of view and a couple other things, um, something that's kind of harder to substantiate is what does it look like to actually look through the optic? And this is something that cameras struggle with. Um, it's it's very hard to, to kind of make the camera see precisely what your eye is seeing when I look through the optic for a variety of reasons. So the Kale's, I know it's a really, you know, kind of cliche term, but has really good edge to edge clarity. And what I mean by that is a lot of cheaper um, low power variable optics or even the Vortex have a little bit of bending or in some cases a lot of bending at the edges where the light is kind of bending around. So you don't have a very flat image. The K16i has a very 
clear image of clarity around the entirety of the ring of what you're looking through. In addition to that, the image is very flat. What I mean by flat is low power variable optics can tend to sometimes fish eye as you're looking through them and you're scanning through, depending on how close something is. Uh, the K16i is one of the flattest images that I've seen, definitely on par with the Mark VI or a little bit better. So I've been very impressed with that. The light transmission is pretty phenomenal. It's on par with the Mark VI, which is on par with the Night Force, better than the Vortex, but again, it's not you know, massively better. It is just simply better. So don't expect to be able to use this thing in the dead of night. Uh, you definitely are gonna need a good illumination source when you get into dust, just like with any other low power variable optic. It is kind of a limiter when it comes to these types of optics. Now that we've talked a little bit about that, let's talk a little bit about the adjustments moving down the K16i. So we have the end of the optic going over to our adjustments. So first off, um, I am a big fan of the adjustments right here. Each click equals 0.1 MRAD. Very precise, uh, definitely something that I wanna see. I like it when the, um, when the adjustments are more precise, just so I can get that round precisely where I want it. Instead of being kind of between two clicks, it's right on there. So I've been very happy with that. The clicks are very positive. They feel good. Um, definitely a fan of the adjustments on the K16i. What's really cool about this is the illumination. So I'm a guy who really harps on illumination, making sure that it looks good and all that type of stuff. And with the K16i, not only is it a, a very bright reticle, but it also has very good battery life. And on top of that, what's kind of cool is instead of having like little settings that you click through, it's just kind of a continuous range where it goes from dim all the way to as bright as it goes. Now, if you're expecting like aim point bright, like burning out your retina like you get from the uh, Vortex HD Gen 2, that's not what you're getting with the, with the uh, K16i. And in fact, that's not something that I want from a low power variable optic. What I want from low power variable optic is a reticle that gets bright enough to be used in daylight conditions to make sure when I'm you know, panning through shadowed areas that I don't lose that reticle. And that's definitely the case with this. It is plenty bright, much brighter than the EOTech Voodoo and definitely brighter than the Leupold Mark VI, which I think has a really bright dot and, and the Night Force too. So it definitely excels compared to those optics. And a combination of other factors like edge-to-edge -edge clarity and light transmission make for an optic that is really nice to shoot through and coupled with you know, the eye relief and the generous eye box, just a phenomenal optic. So speaking of reticles, we have the SM1 reticle on this particular optic. I am a huge fan of this reticle, so realize that depending on what reticle you choose kind of is gonna dictate kind of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, the SM1, I, th I think, is one of the more popular reticles, at least it's what I usually see the reviews on. And the best way to describe it is a half-eaten donut of death with giant lines pointing to it. So it's like an EOTech on steroids, and I'm a big fan of that. The circle in the center is eaten out at the bottom, and then that portion of the circle is illuminated, and you have an illuminated center dot. And I don't know if I've said it before, well I have, but that reticle gets plenty bright for a variety of situations, so I'm a huge fan of that. Now, once you go from there, you have your elevation holds going all the way down. Now, there's not so much in the way of windage. There's some argument about whether or not that is needed on a optic of this uh, capability as far as, uh, you know, one to six power, eight power. Sometimes I like it. I've definitely used windage holds in the past, especially shooting out to 700 with an AR. But uh, if that's something you kind of you're more into where you're kind of worried about that, you can get a different type of reticle. For what I've been using this for, you know, out to about 450, uh, this reticle has been plenty fine. And speaking of this, I have pushed this uh, particular optic out to around 500. Uh, very easy to get hits with due in large part to the reticle, the brightness, the eye box, the edge edge clarity, the light transmission, everything makes for a very pleasurable shooting experience when using the K16i. Another thing to note as well is that the adjustable lever to go from one power up to six power back is very, very smooth. That was a problem I really had with the Vortex uh, Razor HD Gen 2, where it was very stiff to actuate, and you really needed a giant scope ring to be able to, to you know, turn that back and forth. I know there are tricks and tips to make that work a little bit better. But I like that this comes from the factory, just very smooth. It feels like quality when you're rotating it. Now, I wish they would have done something similar to Night Force when it comes to this little scope lever right here. So on the Night Force, they have a simple little 
uh, knurled ring that you can screw in and kind of change the position as you needed or add an extended one. I think that was a really good choice. Um, that being said, this Night Force is super stiff compared to the K16i. So I wish there's something that where it's something that you can more easily swap out, but um, you know that's kind of my only concern when it comes to this because it is so smooth to run back and forth, and that is something that I've definitely had a problem with with a lot of optics. Now, with something like this, it's it's very lightweight, has great transmission. A lot of people question the durability of the K16i. As far as whether these have been used overseas, they have. Um, as far as the durability versus you know things like the tank, you know the Vortex Razor HD or the Mark VI, it seems to be on par with them. The only information I've seen uh, contrary to that seems to be some information of individuals who've had these dent easily. I haven't personally seen that. I've been tr I've treated this uh, optic very terribly because I'm awful with my stuff, and I definitely have gouges just like any of my other optics. Um, but I don't think it's a fragile optic in any case. And even from individuals who have had these uh, get messed up or dented, they say that the optic still performs fine. So I think it is a uh, perfectly robust optic. I'll be doing a giant optic torture test in the future. Maybe I'll throw this on a scar and like throw it off a cliff or something. Who knows? But uh, Or yeet it off a cliff. But I think this is plenty durable for what its uh, intended purposes. Now the only thing I want to talk about um, past that is a little bit about the actual mount that you use for the optics. So the mount really matters. Make sure that you get a good mount. Um, you guys know that I recommend the Scalar Works mount, which is what I have this in because it has an auto level in there to get it level. And it's a very robust, very lightweight mount. I love the locking mechanism, nothing sticking out where I can bust up my hand on there. Other good mounts are things like Geisley, uh, American Defense makes some great ones as well. But I definitely recommend Scalar Works. I know that they're more expensive. But again, sometimes quality costs. And if you're buying a really expensive optic, you should probably put it in a good mount. So where does the K16i fall compared to other optics? Better than the Vortex and definitely on par with the Mark VI. The one way it beats the Mark VI, hands down, is going to be um, in the field of view. Other things, it's pretty neck and neck and it's a little bit more uh, situational. What do you need it for? What are you using it for? Because there are some great things about the Mark VI, like its reticle, that I appreciate a little bit more. That being said, the K16i is a very fast, very intuitive um, reticle to use. So find what works for you, just like anything else. I can't say if something's going to work for you and what you do, whether that be you know, competitive shooting or you know, duty use or military use or LARPing, what have you. So get out there and find what it's gonna work for, but I can without a doubt recommend the K16i for almost anything that you could possibly need it for. Yes, it costs money. Yes, it's a diminishing return over the Vortex Razor, I'm being honest, but it is definitely one of the best optics money can currently buy. So get out there and get the K16i. Now, as with everything, as cool as this optic is, it's not going to make you a better shooter. In fact, if you're a terrible shooter, you're still going to suck with it. So make sure you get training. Cogworks, Bear Solutions, Haley Strategic, who is maybe my dad, Esoteric, Tony Cowden, all of these great instructors out there willing to give you their knowledge so that you can become a better shooter and a better advocate for 2A. So before we leave, I know you guys are going to ask a little bit about the setup. So first off, we have a BCM QRF railed upper. The QRF rail is BCM's uh, normal little lockup system, which I love, along with a quad rail. Very well made. We have a BCM uh, comp on the end, Arisaka mount with their uh, offset Picatinny mount that puts it right up against my PEC-15. We have a Surefire dual pressure pad. Front one is for the light, back one runs the PEC-15. We have a BCM CAG, which is a kinesthetic angled grip. Moving back there, of course, we have the K16i. We have enhanced performance magazines. We have this all on a Daniel Defense lower with one of the BCM grips. Um, don't like the safety so much because I hate dual safeties, but have that on there. Running the JP trigger, um, giving this a shot right now, trying it out, some of their stuff, and I love it so far. Um, running the B5 stock and the BCM charging handle, giving that a shot because BCM has yelled at me for only using radiant stuff. So I need to give everybody a fair shot. So we're working with that right now. And that is this particular rifle. Gentlemen, ladies, thank you for watching. Take care of yourself. And uh, I got nothing else for you. Last thing that I have for you is invest your time 
and your efforts into people who are not toxic. And what I mean by that is there are people who just create drama and make your life more difficult and continue to do so, maybe get better at times or just continue to do so. I realize that you have a finite time on earth. Your time is very valuable. And I don't mean to cut everybody out, I mean, anybody that ever makes you mad, I don't mean that at all. But just to say that there are some people who will drag you down and to understand when to uh, leave good enough alone and just kind of get away from those situations because ultimately you need to make yourself happy. A little bit of uh, you know, self-love, a little bit of uh, Anne Rand there. So get out there, guys. Thank you for watching. Love you guys. Take care of yourselves.